In the last episode of the Southampton career mode, we signed Ben Sabani to add experience and an improvement to our rating at the left back position. Two potential goalkeeper transfers were presented, Henderson and Ramsdale. A late winner by Ings against Crystal Palace pushed us forward in the Premier League. Hey, what's going on everyone? Flick here. Welcome back to another episode of our FIFA 21 Southampton crew mode. This is episode number six. And after a favorable start to our Premier League campaign in the last episode, we're looking to finish season three strong and achieve qualification for a European competition for the first time in this career mode. Last episode was a big one in terms of deciding the future of the Southampton squad, both for existing players and new players coming in. After a lengthy review, we decided to keep Danny Ings in the Southampton squad rather than transfer listing him and receiving his peak market value. The thought process behind that is that he is going to be a leader and role model for the rest of the squad and hopefully any future first team strikers. I also presented a few options for which goalkeeper for us to pursue in this January transfer window. And I appreciate you all leaving comments. I think we have decided on a good goalkeeper to bring in, which we will be discussing today. I was also happy to see the general response on the last episode and just this Southampton series in general. FIFA 21 has been so refreshing as far as career mode is concerned. I'm having a lot of fun playing it and making content, and I hope that is reflected in the videos. If you wanna help support this Southampton series, leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on future uploads. But let's push on with the episode and try to keep our momentum high. I presented two options for potential goalkeeper transfers for you all to consider. Dean Henderson, who is currently backing up Kaylor Navas over at PSG after backing up David De Gea at Manchester United and Aaron Ramsdale, another high potential English goalkeeper still at Sheffield United. And after reading over the comments on the last episode, the overwhelming response was for me to bring in Henderson, which we will attempt to do. While the Henderson transfer will likely use up the majority of our remaining transfer budget, I still think he will be a great addition to the squad we're pretty much going to be sorted now at the goalkeeper position. Henderson, of course, having an amazing potential, and we can still use Gunn for any cup matches or if an injury occurs. We had to do a little bit of adjusting to our transfer budget, but with the departure of a few players, we had just about enough to sign Dean Henderson for 55 million. He agreed to a crucial squad role on a four-year deal worth 60 grand a week. While this was not necessarily the plan going into the recording, we received a number of offers for our highest overall center back, Jan Bednarek. One of those teams was Liverpool, who started out negotiations at 60.3 million. And after a little bit of back and forth between me and Jurgen Klopp, we eventually agreed on a deal worth 75 million. This was also the same transfer fee that Liverpool were rumored to have signed Van Dyke for just a few years ago. And I think that's only fitting considering Bednarek will likely be Van Dyke's replacement for Liverpool in this save. I know this is a big departure from the club, but I kind of want to walk you through my thought process for doing so. One of the primary reasons being a lot of the current squad consists of original Southampton players. And while I think it's amazing that we've been able to help so many Southampton players reach their peak potential, I do want to see some turnover in the squad and the departure of Bednarek will help us do so. And as we think about the long-term future of this save, squad depth is only going to become more and more important, especially once we are in European competitions. An extra 75 million in our transfer budget will help us address a few key positions and not just our goalkeeper. With the departure of a big player like Bednarek, I do want to think about bringing in a future replacement like Weston McKenney, who was for a while rumored to join the Saints over the summer. While he eventually left Schalke for Juventus, that hasn't exactly worked out for him in this save as Juve have just continued to bring in more center midfield options as well as other center backs. So for those reasons, I think this move makes a lot of sense for McKinney and to make matters even better, we picked him up for under his market value, signing him for just 30 million. He agreed to a rotational squad role on a four-year deal worth 50 grand a week. And while he is listed as a center midfielder, I am excited to test out development plans and change that position to a center back. We'll see how long that does take. And the transfers don't stop there. We are also going to bring in former Celtic striker and current Wolverhampton Wanderer man, Edson Edouard. I appreciate all the comments in the last episode suggesting potential strikers that we could bring in, but I felt like Edouard was the best fit for us. He's at a good rating of 81 and only going up. So I see him being the future replacement for Ings. Considering that we did business with another Premier League side, this was a fairly expensive transfer, 43 million to be exact. As far as the contract goes, Edouard agreed to an important first team role to a four-year deal worth 54 grand a week. Outside of the Bednarek deal, we had three other players that left the club in January and the months that followed it. Most notably, Armstrong set to leave for fellow Premier League side Burnley. While this was another tough transfer to make, these days, Armstrong isn't getting as much playtime as he was in season one. So while I appreciate what he contributed to the squad at the beginning of this career mode, I think it's best that we let him leave. We also saw two players that were promoted from our youth academy leave the club. This was mostly an effort to try to help us meet our board objective. 
of youth player sales. Some of you might be wondering about my plans for other strikers in our squad, and I want to address that. So to start off with, I have changed Ings to the mobile striker development plan. From my understanding, this will help slow down some of his key attributes from declining so quickly, particularly his pace and shooting. And then of course, we have another striker available, Obafemi, who is only going to see an increase to his attributes. So in total, we have Ings, Obafemi, as well as Edward and Adams, who will all rotate into the side between matches. This is what the McKenny dev plan will look like as we try to change him from a center mid to a center back. It'll take roughly three or four months, depending on how his form goes, that may go quicker. And finally, I have changed Newton's development plan to make him a center attacking mid. He has kind of stunted his growth. We haven't seen an increase to his overall in about a season and a half. So I'm hoping that this will help alleviate that. I have a couple of Youth Academy updates as we continue to try to sign players from Asia to help meet our board objectives. We will be scouting out South Korea for six months looking for a physically strong player. And as a tribute to Ralph Hasenhutl, we will be scouting out Austria for six months looking for any type of player. After an eventful transfer window that saw a lot of players arriving and departing the club, this is what our squad will look like for the remainder of season three. And while McKinney works on that development plan to have center back be his primary position, I'll likely be giving Ayer starts over him. But let's see how this new look Southampton squad does, whether some of our new arrivals can make an impact on the team and whether we can finally qualify for Europe. While our play in the Premier League has improved this season, unfortunately our cup performances have not followed. We were knocked out in the fourth round of the Carabao Cup to Brentford, and then in the fifth round of the FA Cup, Brighton took us to extra time where they scored two goals. We'll look to get our revenge against Brighton back in the Premier League, and because Ward Prowse had to sit this match out due to a red card suspension, we decided to give McKenney his first start for Southampton at the center mid position. McKenney will kick off our first highlight of the match as he plays this pass to Adams, who then plays a pass through to Ings. Good save on the near post, though, from Matt Ryan, who's been solid between the sticks for Brighton this season. And Brighton have actually seen an improvement to their Premier League standing. They're right around mid-table trying to compete for a Europa League spot. Again, a chance denied uh, by Ryan. I think that was a Salisu header. And I wanted to show a defensive display of our own Ayer getting the nod to start because McKenney is still working on his center back development plan. Um, and honestly, he's been incredible for me in game. It's just really the matter of his overall rating be a, being a bit low. So hopefully within the next few seasons, Ayer can see an improvement and we can maybe think about starting him in more matches. A good skill move there by Gineppo. I'm utilizing more of that R1 slash RB dribbling to create space. Gineppo again, look at this pass inside to Adams. He places it on a tee and Adams will not be missing from there. It took us a while to break down Brighton, but I think that goal makes up for it. Still in the first half, it's going to be Ben Sabani who gets involved in some attacking action, playing this pass through to Adams. He decides to go solo on this effort, getting in on his preferred right foot, cutting inside, and a beautiful finesse shot around Ryan. There's nothing he could have done about either of these goals. Judging off of our defensive performances in this match, we weren't missing Ben the Rec too bad. Good stop there initially by Salisu, but I think I lost track of who I was controlling, and unfortunately, McAllister was wide open for the pass. Henderson just about stopped this shot, and we'll see from the replay how close it actually was. But a big moment here as Edouard gets his first minutes for Southampton as we sub Ings off. Although Brighton will continue to create chances, we'll do our best to stay compact defensively as Ayer puts himself between the man and the ball, stopping another Brighton opportunity. We'll get a chance of our own as Edouard tries to get a shot on target. Blocked by Brighton, though, as Adams plays this to the left-hand side. It's Stangs playing this across. Unfortunately, Edouard's effort was fairly tame. He needs a little bit of time to adjust to how we play here at Southampton. Danny Eggs might have been able to finish that chance, but a huge double save by Henderson. First time I was actually using him in-game, and what a performance he put in as we tried to get on a counterattack and seal this match. Nanda is very patient with this play. Finds Ben Zabani, who plays this through to Stangs. We have a few options in the middle. We'll go with the low pass and a cheeky finish by Edouard. That is how you make a debut for yourself at any club. And I think he showcased a little bit of his flair that he offers with that finish. That match was probably closer than it needed to be, but I'm happy to start off the episode with another three points and a big performance by some of our new signings. Edouard will have a chance to feature in the starting 11 against his former side, Wolves, who haven't made a whole lot of signings in this save. But to be fair, Wolves like us have a high potential side to start off with, so we can't take them lightly. It did not take long for us to create our first attacking chance of the match, and what an opportunity this is, as Edouard, with what may be goal of the entire series, 
against his former side as well. This was absolutely incredible. Considering we just brought this guy in, he's trying to make a statement showing that he's ready to be a starting striker for us. And if he continues to play like this, I don't think it'll take him long. Wolves will try their best to respond to that goal as they get into the final third. And they are fouled with what looks to be a penalty, but... The ref does not point to the spot, so we get away with a free kick here. It is a well-taken effort on the near post, but luckily we get away with one. I'm not sure if Henderson got a piece of the chance, but it ricochets off the post, and we will look to get on a counterattack as Obafemi turns his defender and turns on the Jets down this left-hand side. Has a few options in the middle, trying to pick someone out. He will eventually send in the cross to the far post, more or less. The header is knocked down. And what an effort this is from James Ward-Prowse. We haven't seen too many volleys from him in this career mode, but as he continues to work on his balance development plan, his finishing is getting better and better. We're still just 30 minutes into the match, and it seems like it's been a full 90 minutes worth of events, but Nandez with a good tackle there to win us back possession, playing a great through ball as well to Obafemi. He won't be missing from there, off the post and in. This is one of the first goals that Obafemi has scored this season, and I have a theory that when you sign talented players like Edouard, existing players in the squad step up their performances. For me, this is going to create a culture at Southampton where no player is bigger than the club. We play as a unit and we perform at an incredible level as we'll get a fourth goal here from Edouard all before the halftime break. I can see why it was suggested by you all and I'm glad those suggestions came in. We'll jump forward to the 64th minute as Ward Prowse leads the Wolves defenders one way and plays through Obafemi. Finally, a good save from Patricio who to be honest, I expected a better performance from. But we all have off days, and when we're creating as many chances as we are in this match, it's always going to be difficult. Stang's again getting involved and setting up Edward in a very similar way as he did in the last match. The finish, however, was taken a bit differently as Edward showcases that four-star weak foot. Diallo was brought on as a sub, and he'll set up Ings here as we try to score the elusive chip over the keeper i've still yet to score that exact type of goal in this save so far and it's going to happen before we're done with this career mode as we get into the three minutes of added time we're already up five nil why not push for six as ward prowse gets the ball forward and now he's looking for options spots out stangs just outside the 18 and man oh man what a volleyed effort that was there was something about this recording for me where things were just gelling and i think i realized how effective these volleyed efforts are for at least our players in the southampton squad but what a performance this was by edouard three goals from just three shots on target hopefully this is the first of many match balls he receives as we get to the later stages of the season two matches left to play and we have a very important fixture against the very club Ben Nurek left for Liverpool. We will be without our starting right back, Kyle Walker-Peters, because he suffered an injury. He'll be out for eight weeks and the rest of the season. But this is why we've chosen to go with squad depth. Valerie will step right in, and he should do the job at right back. You'll notice a couple of changes to the Liverpool squad. Of course, they had Ben Nurek at the left center back position. Also, Marquinhos paired up with him. And in the midfield, an inclusion of Awar and Koke. If you thought our last match against Wolves had lots of goals, get ready because you will not be disappointed by these highlights. James Ward-Prowse will get the first highlight of the match, saved well though by Alisson, who we actually didn't play against last time we featured Liverpool. It was Karius between the sticks. But we will get our first goal through Adams, a 12-minute effort, just tapped in and putting himself in the right sort of position to score that one. This here wasn't the best attacking sequence that I've seen all season. We missed out the initial run by Stangs, but luckily he got back on side and he'll square this across to Ings, who separated from Bednarek. It was a bit of a defensive liability for Liverpool in this match and certainly didn't justify the 75 million transfer, but I genuinely hope that he grows into this Liverpool squad. I wish the best for him. He just didn't put in the best performance in this match. But speaking of poor defensive displays, it was Salisu who allowed Liverpool to have this penalty. It's Mo Salah to step up, but Dean Henderson, big save from him, and he continues to shine in this third season. Unfortunately, Liverpool will score a header from the ensuing corner kick. Not too much that Henderson could have done about this one, as I think he even tipped this effort. Liverpool certainly have one of the best midfields in the Premier League, and the thing about them is that they like to get involved in the attack. Awar wins back possession a few times, tries to eventually play this across to Firmino, but Salisu in the right sort of position to deny that effort. Here's Adams playing it across to Ward-Prowse. Eventually finding Ings, a good save from Alisson to deny that effort as he had to stretch and make that save. But now it's in the second half as Stangs from this sort of position 
has created so many goals for us. That's at least the third one just from the gameplay highlights alone. As if I'm being honest, I was trying to play that to the first player, but Chinepo gets on the end of it and a good finesse shot effort on the near post. It's Gineppo again getting involved on this right side. Edouard and him seem to have a good initial partnership. Maybe that will be the one to watch in the future of this save as Edouard shows his physical presence. And we don't score too many header goals in this career mode, but when you have the height available that Edouard offers, you may as well make the most of it. While we have a three goal cushion at this point, we certainly can't let up. We've seen in the past how quickly these top sides can find their way back into the match as Awar eventually gets his goal off of a couple deflections from our defenders and we sort of backed off from him. It's our strikers again seeking out our wingers as they look to get behind the Liverpool defense trying to find someone in the middle. It's Shea Adams who makes the eventual run splitting three Liverpool defenders. I'm not sure what they were doing but we'll absolutely take another goal as a cheeky celebration there from Adams but it's Adams again in the 82nd minute, and this might be one of my favorite passing plays in the whole episode. We were just on another level throughout this match. When we're playing freely and making the most of the creativity that this squad has to offer, great goals come as a result. Liverpool will get one more chance here as we get into the last three minutes of this match. Again, it's the deflections from the defenders. We get a piece of the ball, but somehow the attackers still manage to retain possession as this effort was taken well on the near post by Mane, but we will walk out of Anfield with all three points. Essentially, that'll secure us Champions League for next season, but we still have our final match day to play. And this last Premier League match day had extra significance because it will be the last match that Ryan Bertrand will feature in for us. He's retiring at the end of the season, and whenever a player approaches me about featuring in their last home match, I certainly try to give them some play time, and considering how important Bertrand has been for us in this career mode, I'm going to give him the start. This is what the table looks like going into the last Premier League match day. We still have some possibility of winning the league title, believe it or not, but we'd have to have a lot go our way. City would need to get a loss, and we'll have to make up that goal differential. Along with that, Chelsea would have to get a draw or a loss, otherwise they would overtake City. You can't forget about Spurs, who are basically level with us in terms of the points and goal differential. This is the squad that will line up for us. I kind of wish we still had some of our Season 1 players like Romeu and Armstrong, but unfortunately we did transfer them out of the squad this season. Considering we spent three seasons now at Southampton, I know how this squad plays, what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, and what we need to improve on moving forward. And that's what makes me really excited about the future of this save. Anyways, Ings will get involved once again as he gets this on his weak foot, but still curls it around the keeper with ease. He just gets better as he ages. And I hope his goal scoring ability stays as good as this the rest of his career. One of my favorite things about this 4-4-2 formation that we've grown accustomed to at Southampton is how good our midfielders are at passing these days. They've grown in their overall so much. And with Ward Prowse having high medium work rates, he usually finds himself in a good attacking position as he nets our second goal here. But this is going to be an incredible bit of pressing play from Ings. He fought to win his back possession, and he will square this effort across to Adams. No mistake about it. He will make it three, and it seemed like we were on track to score yet again more goals than the last match. Leeds were doing their best to get back into this match by pouring forward their defenders, but I think that hurt them more than it helped them. It's a two on three here as we eventually find this over to Ings. The goalkeeper closed down the space well, though. We didn't have much of an angle to do much with that effort, but... Again, it's the pressing play as we transition to the second half. This time, Adams wins us back the ball, plays through Gineppo. He's got the pace. He's got the finishing ability as he goes to the far post. Makes things four for us. Prior to this episode, I think Gineppo had zero goals and zero assists in the first half of the season. That wasn't the case in the second half. Just a few minutes later, we'll get another chance, showcasing some quick passing play. First time back heels, first time through balls. Eventually, Adams will bring this effort down and he will score our fifth goal of the match. This was one of the better taken efforts, and I'm not sure what was better, the lob through ball by Nandez or the control and finish by Adams. It seems like Leeds do not have a moment to regroup defensively as we win back possession again in the 56th minute. Adams creates some space with that drag back, and this first time effort from Stangs was absolutely brilliant. I cannot wait to see him take over as our new starting left midfielder now that his overall is higher than Redmond's. With that said, we'll have the option to feature either player because they've been so good for us. It was only a matter of time before Leeds decided to do something on the attacking front. Bamford was very fortunate to hang on to possession there. He was basically just spamming skill moves and 
the ball rolled out in front of him and it was a one-on-one -on -one between him and Henderson. Of course, he had to go with the chip effort and Henderson just about caught up to this one, but we lose the clean sheet there. Really no worries because Leeds will not be getting back into this match as the through ball is played through to Ward Prowse and take a look at this goal. We were just flicking the ball up a few times and we go again with the volleyed effort. We had a couple goals throughout this episode that might be contenders for goal of the season and this is certainly one of them. But as we enter the four minutes of added extra time, I decided to move Bertrand to the left striker position. I don't know why. I thought, hey, maybe he'll get involved in an attacking play. And of course this ball rebound straight back to him as he will close out this match and his career with a goal for Southampton and he celebrates in style that'll put the final result at eight to one I have no words for the gameplay that was shown in this episode we were just too good but I'll be looking at some slider options to hopefully make this legendary with competitor mode a little bit more balanced some clutch performances toward the end of the season ended up paying off as we saw a huge improvement from season two, finishing second in the Premier League. Manchester City were Premier League champions this time around, but all the teams that finished top four were just a few points away from each other. Liverpool and Brighton also appear to have achieved qualification for European competitions as they will be getting involved in the Europa League. But as we transition to the bottom half of the table, it was an interesting end to the season as Burnley, Sheffield United, and Watford were relegated. However, the teams that finished ahead of them in the table did not have many more points. We're actually going to see the same order of club top goal scorers this season as we saw last year. Adams led the way, 25 goals across 36 matches. Ward Prowse in second, 17 goals from 42 matches, and Ings in third, 12 goals from 38. We had a three-way tie for club top assists, but I ranked things by basically whoever had the least appearances ranked higher in the ranking. Ings was our top assist maker, nine assists from 38 matches. Gineppo in second, again, nine assists from 38. And Nana is in third, nine assists from 40. Adams continues to improve from his impressive goal scoring display in season two. He is now finished as the Premier League top scorer, 25 goals from 36 matches. And what I like to do when a player has an achievement like top scorers, top assists, or most clean sheets is customize their appearance in game. So potentially for this case, I was thinking about giving Adam some golden boots. Let me know what you think about that idea or whether you'd like for me to keep Adam's original boots. But as we move over to the assist category, we had three players in the top six. Nandez with nine assists from 38 matches, Gineppo with nine assists from 37 matches, and Ings with eight assists from 35 matches. Let's not forget that Angus Gunn still has an important role in the Southampton squad, even if he is no longer our starting goalkeeper. He still finished as having the fifth most clean sheets in the Premier League, 11 clean sheets from 23 matches. We'll review our performance in some of the other competitions this season as we saw an early exit in the fourth round of the Carabao Cup to Brentford. It was Manchester City who won that competition. Of course, we were knocked out in the round of 16 of the FA Cup to Brighton. The winner of this competition was Spurs. It was an all English Champions League final, and while Spurs didn't have the best Premier League season, Clearly, they are still a strong side as they beat Manchester City in the final 3-2. Valencia were winners of the Europa League over RB Leipzig. That final actually went to penalties. I thought it would be a good idea to quickly recap how the championship finished, considering that three of these teams will be joining us in the Premier League next season. It was Fulham and Brentford that achieved automatic promotion. It's still yet to be seen who else will be joining us. However, as we look at the bottom end of the table, it was Luton Town, Portsmouth, our rivals, and Sunderland, who will be sent down to League One. We had a couple of Youth Academy promotions at the end of the season. This was mostly to help us attempt to achieve our board objectives. So we signed up a couple of players from Japan that we managed to scout out in the first half of this season. As per usual, I'll be scrolling through all the players that we currently have in this Southampton squad. And I will say that any of the players that had been part of this team for the entirety of season three saw a pretty massive improvement to their overall, even some of the new additions saw an improvement. So I am very excited about what season four has in store for us, both in terms of what we might be able to achieve in Europe, but also as some of these players continue to increase in their overall and start to reach their peak potential. We still have a few players that we're looking to offload like McCarthy, who isn't receiving any play time. And hopefully we can achieve that in future transfer windows. As far as our board objectives go, we did all right. I would say we achieved about half of them, but more importantly, our manager rating is no longer in the red. We're at a very respectable 74, and I think that will only continue to go up as we get a refresh of our objectives, and we can hopefully meet some of those. Of course, we'll be staying for a fourth season with the Saints as we now have a new challenge in Europe, 
and we can look to push on and potentially win a Premier League title within the next few years. I don't think there's a whole lot of areas that we need to improve this squad. However, I will be looking for any potential regens. I have been on the lookout for regens for players like Gareth Bale, Dushan Tadic, Jose Font, just to name a few. So stay tuned for that in the next episode. But if you have enjoyed today's video, make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you're new around here. But until next time, this has been Flick. I'll be talking to you all again soon.